Lowe's starts right now. A lot of people need a test, but a lot of people can't get one. Metro Health just reported more than 2,700 new COVID-19 cases as the Omicron variant, variant rather, continues to spread through the city. Our Garrett Berger talked with a local urgent care clinic chain about what they're seeing. So Garrett, what is the testing situation like right now? Well, I'm actually at a different location here at Fredericksburg and 410, a drive through location. You don't need an appointment. Fortunately, that has brought crowds. You can see this line stretching back. When we first arrived here, it was about four tenths of a mile long. Not sure where it is now, but these people up at the front have been waiting more than six hours. And with 6 p.m. coming on the closing time, they may not get in anyways. But it was necessary to try. People we talked to at this line saying they needed a negative result to go back to work. And wherever they look, it's hard to get a test, hard to make an appointment, or to wait in lines like these, or where the results take too long. Right now, the positivity rate in the community is over 27%. And every new positive case means people they came in contact with have to worry too and come in for a test there of their own. And the chief operating officer of Texas Med Clinic, which also offers COVID tests, estimates their San Antonio locations handle 1,200 to 1,500 a day. And some spots are reaching their capacity for other patients too. Testing that we're doing along with the sick, you know, the ill people and injured people that we're seeing, we are seeing as many as we possibly can. And we're having at some point in the day to say, we can't add any more, I'm sorry. The city has a list of more than 100 testing locations, some free, but most that may have a cost attached. And of course, it's hard to say who has space to spare. Now, making things more complicated, Metro Health says they have heard reports of potentially unauthorized testing locations. They're urging people that if you do go to get tested, to make sure that the location is affiliated with a medical facility or a lab. And they say the locations listed on their website, their website have been vetted, so you know those are legit at least. Live at Fredericksburg and 410, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. It's still quite the long line out there. Thank you, Garrett. Now for a breakdown of where Bear County stands when it comes to the new COVID-19 cases. Take a look. As we mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, the county has more than 2,700 new cases. That brings our overall total since the pandemic started to 358,489 cases. Meanwhile, 569 people are in the hospital tonight. 134 of which are in intensive care. The restaurant industry continues to be hit hard by this pandemic. The Texas Restaurant Association estimates that 9,000 of the state's 50,000 restaurants didn't make it. Now, many of those left are facing staffing problems because of the latest surge in COVID-19 cases. Jesse Degollado tells us that that only compounds the already existing shortage of employees. At Nietzsche's, business is good. Staffing, eh, not so much. Nobody's coming out to apply. The ones that are applying aren't following up. General Manager Michael Elizondo says not even the offer of higher pay has worked since the lockdown ended. Then came Omicron. Makes things even more difficult because now we have staff members feeling ill, not coming to work. Fortunately, he says none have tested positive. In times like this, the manager says he's had to do whatever necessary to make sure their loyal customers are well served in spite of the circumstances. For instance, normally he has eight servers, but he's down to six. Uh, some days we have to do five and we have to shut down even more tables just so that we don't overwhelm our staff and give poor service to our customers. What are you done with this man? As it is, his head server is doing more of what he says he's always enjoyed, but even then. You know, I have three extra tables that I'm not even supposed to have. I'm running around like crazy. And back in the kitchen? The kitchen staff, they're overworked. Everybody's putting in overtime now. It's really the latest twist and turn on the roller coaster that has been COVID-19. Now, when there aren't enough workers to fill in for those calling in sick, the solution? Come out and apply. Whether it's here or down the street, doesn't matter. Let's get back to work. On the south side, Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Is still no answers. It is now day 17 of the search for three year old Lena Keel. The FBI dive team ending their search today without any conclusive findings just a few hours ago. As a matter of fact, our Jaffney Gray live at the Villas del Cabo apartment complex where little Lena disappeared back on December 20th. Jaffney, I, I can't imagine 
this family, what they've been going through. It has to be hard for them knowing they're really back at square one in this whole thing. Yes, Steve, it is very devastating to them. Uh, it's just the unknown, not knowing where Lena is located or if she's alive. This is still being investigated as a missing person's case. Now, the family shared their thoughts of thankfulness about the entire investigation through Pamela Allen with Eagles Flight San Antonio. That's a nonprofit that supports many families with missing loved ones. She tells me that even though the family is going through a lot, they're still remaining hopeful. He was being briefed by the FBI and he went to his knees and just started praying. He wants his daughter home. He misses his daughter. He loves his daughter. Father of three year old Lena Kill, Rias Kill, has been on an emotional roller coaster since his baby girl disappeared from the Villas del Cabo apartment complex December 20th. Due to the language barrier, Rias asked Pamela Allen with Eagles Flight San Antonio to speak on his behalf. What he's praying is that someone has her, keeping her alive, and that they'll release her. Since Lena's disappearance, Riaz has had to quit his job to focus on his family's well-being. The Afghan community stepping in to raise funds for him during this traumatizing time. They could help him with resources, with groceries, with utilities. They put that together for him just to make sure that this family is going to be okay. Allen says the Kiel family is not only dealing with their missing daughter, but unfortunately, they've also been attacked online. They came through such a war-torn area. And so when they hear some of these things about, oh, they sold her, oh, they, just very negative remarks, it, it just uh, hurts them because they love their daughter so much and they want her back. Ria says despite some of the negative comments, they're grateful they've been positively received by others. They are just saying thank you so much to everyone who has been lifting this case in prayer who has been thinking about Lena, who's adopted this baby girl as their own, they understand that this community cares. Now, the FBI dive team wrapped up their search earlier without any conclusive findings, but Chief William McManus did say that they're not letting up their search efforts, saying that they're going to tackle any lead that they can get. And they're also asking for your tips. You can send your tips to their missing persons line. That number is 210-207-7660. That reward information money is still at $150,000. Live from the Northwest side, Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. New at six, a member of a prominent San Antonio political family will remain on the ballot for the March primary. Lisa Uresti Dasher, a candidate for district court judge, had been accused in court of putting inaccurate information on her application regarding her legal name and how long she's lived in Texas. Dylan Collier on the judge's decision to keep the race intact. We have we have spent two days and now we know we know. Day two of the virtual hearing into the legitimacy of Lisa Uresti Dasher's application for judge had its fair share of tense moments. But we are Mr. bothering us. Mr. Toscano. The lead attorneys for both Democratic candidates for 285th District Court squabbled throughout today's proceeding, weeks after Uresti Dasher's opponent, Nadine Nieto, filed suit to have her removed from the ballot. Uresti Dasher peppered with questions about how long she's lived in Bear County, why her official answer changed between 2020 and last year, and whether she's actually running under her legal name. The local attorney is the daughter of Bear County tax assessor collector Albert Uresti and the niece of disgraced state senator Carlos Uresti, who's a few years into serving a 12-year federal prison sentence. And I acquired Uresti by law. I acquired Dasher by marriage. Nowhere in the code have I ever seen that it says you cannot put a hyphen in between the two, sir. The hearing added fuel to an already contentious campaign. You know, we're supposed to have objections, not not speaking objections, not not this kind of battering and 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 badgering conduct. After nearly six hours of testimony spread across two days, visiting Judge John Gabriel denied the request for temporary injunction. But the request today for Mr. Barrett is is to um, take Mr. Uresti Dasher off the ballot. Uh, this court is not inclined to do so. Uresti Dasher is also allowed to keep her campaign signs how they are with no changes to the spelling of her name. Early voting in this race is scheduled to begin February 14th. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. So what about the woman that actually filed this lawsuit that wanted 
your rusty dash are taken off. Well, Nieto released a statement after the judge's ruling that reads in part, I am disappointed about what this decision means for the integrity of Bear County elections, but I am unshaken as we move forward with this campaign. Meanwhile, your rusty dashers attorney Andrew Toscano told KSAT quote, she is disappointed that her opponent has decided to run her campaign at the courthouse rather than among the voters of our county. However, she looks forward to presenting her candidacy to Bear County voters. A murder trial is taking place this week despite in-person trials being suspended this month. Edison Kataman is on trial for the March 2020 murder of his cousin, Christopher Kataman. Today, testimony was heard from a crime scene investigator and an SAPD investigator who said because there were witnesses to the shooting, police were able to find the suspect fast. I was able to look up the name that was given on the radio uh, by the responding officers um, and the caller. And what name was it? Edison Karaman. Despite the surge in cases right now, this trial is allowed to proceed because the jury was chosen before the latest round of COVID restrictions were put in place at the courthouse. But COVID still having an impact, one juror has been replaced by an alternate because of an exposure. That trial continues tomorrow. A longtime domestic violence prevention advocate in San Antonio has now been tapped to run a statewide organization. Yeah, Marta Pelias tells our Courtney Friedman she is honored to be elected as chair of the Texas Coalition on Family Violence. It's part of Courtney Friedman's series Confronting Domestic Violence, Loving in Fear. When it comes to domestic violence, Marta Pelias is already a highly coveted leader for her knowledge on the subject. The number of programs that we have created in San Antonio that have been piloted throughout the state. She's the CEO of San Antonio's Family Violence Prevention Services and Battered Women and Children's Shelter. And now she was just announced as the newly elected chair for the Texas Council on Family Violence, the only nonprofit joining organizations from all over the state bringing advocacy, guidance, uh, uh, preparation, um, and representation before state legislators and federal legislators. To head an organization of that magnitude, an honor for Palayas. To be able to share with the community those e emerging trends that TCFV is uncovering uh, when it comes to allocations and and federal allocations. She said understanding those statewide trends has been crucial during the pandemic. Palaya says 228 Texans were killed by intimate partners in 2020, a 23% increase from the previous year. She plans to address the isolation and stress contributing to those numbers, as well as specific issues like guns in the hands of perpetrators. So many judges uh, do not ask for the guns when they have the perpetrators in front of them. The workload worth it, knowing she'll now be able to help save even more lives across the state. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam this evening, 68 degrees. What a warm up we're enjoying. It was a nice day today, Adam. Hey, don't enjoy it for too long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A few cold fronts are in the forecast. Today we started off at 38, so we felt the chill in the morning. And by the afternoon, we made it up to 77 for the high. The average high, 63. We're going to be below that a few times here in the coming days. High temperature of 80 degrees in Hondo and Uvalde. Del Rio, 83. Catula, Pleasanton, 82. Relatively warm for this time of year. Tomorrow at noon, 65. Friday, we're back in the 50s. Only to warm over the weekend and then see another temperature dive next week. We'll talk about these yo-yo roller coaster temperatures and what to expect with the cold front in terms of temperatures throughout the day tomorrow and especially wind in just a bit. Here's what we're working on for you tonight on the night beat. More children are dying in Bear County. Tonight, Patty Santos takes a look at the numbers and the message that child advocates have for worried parents. And we're one week away from the city council voting on a proposed CPS energy rate hike. What do you think about your bills going up? The utility company remains under scrutiny about its spending habits and how it handled last February's storm. Tonight, what residents have to say about this possible bill hike. Those stories and more tonight on The Night Beat. Myra. Thanks, Steve.
Red light cameras. They are a sore subject for a lot of drivers and two communities in our area. They still have them on the roads. Our Samuel King joins us now. So Sam, one city says that their hands are tied. Oh, that's right, Meyer, the city of Leon Valley. The council there voted last April to explore getting out of the deal with the company that operates the cameras. That's difficult to do, so for now they remain in place. Leon Valley and Balcony Heights are still two cities allowed to operate the cameras despite the 2019 ban. And that's leaving some drivers fuming. When I got this in the mail, the first thing that I thought in my mind was I was very angry because this is misleading. Jason Campbell received a ticket in Balcony Heights from a red light camera and he refuses to pay. So this is a direct violation to the Texas Transportation Code right here. While the 2019 law passed by the Texas legislature allows Leon Valley and Balcony Heights to keep their cameras, they're not allowed to use it against you if you don't pay the ticket when it comes to renewing your vehicle or license. While you may be reported to collections if you don't pay, it's not authorized to be on your credit report. Yeah, they need to take them down and they need to stop sending these out. How many people have paid this instead of paying a bill? Leon Valley City Council members plan to provide an update during the city's annual town hall meeting later this month. They say the money is used for improvement and safety projects, while one acknowledged there's not much they can actually do to compel people to pay. Meanwhile, the Balcony Heights City Administrator sent over a statement that said in part, the city of Balcony Heights operates a red light safety camera program to protect all people who live, work, and visit our city. The Balcony Heights contract with ATS Vera Mobility runs through 2034. The Balcony Heights Police Department reminds motorists to come to a complete stop at all red lights and stop signs. And officials there tout the safety benefits of the cameras, pointing to a continued reduction in crashes at the intersections where they are posted. Now, a bill that would have allowed both cities to get out of their contracts if passed failed during last year's legislative session. We'll continue to watch it. Taking a quick uh, look at traffic, this is a Loop 410 at a 281. That looks okay, but if you are traveling north of 1604 on 281, still have some issues north of Stone Oak Parkway. 24 minutes now between 1604 and Bolverde Road, only seven minutes the other way. So keep that in mind if you're heading out north of 1604 and 281 this evening, guys. You know, 281 and 410, that intersection, that's always crowded. The I last know. couple of nights, it's last not been. The last couple of nights, it has not been, and I felt that way just on my drives. It seems like yeah. fewer people are out and about. Or staying home. But it's mm. not necessarily because of the weather. However, nobody's getting too comfortable there either. Yeah. Adam. <laughs> you can't really get too comfortable with anything in the weather department. Yeah, more typical weather pattern and uh, temperature pattern, I should say, for this time of year where we have big ups and downs, big swings coming our way. Now, this is what we're expecting in terms of the morning low temperatures. Tomorrow near 40 degrees, some parts of the hill country experiencing a brief light freeze, but locally it will be about 40 degrees. Thursday morning, our next freeze here around town at about 30 degrees. And then this weekend, temperatures go back up with the morning reading in the lower 60s by Sunday. And those are just morning temperatures. I showed you the afternoon temperatures earlier, and they're up and down quite a bit. Let's get a look at the latest what's happening out there right now, and then that cold front where it is and what it's going to do to our temperatures and wind. 70 currently, dew point of 31, south wind at 6 miles per hour, so still fairly dry air in place despite that southerly wind with that dew point of 31. Divine 69, Bolverde 67, Stinson now 71 and Comfort currently at 68 degrees. We had some 80s west and southwest of town, especially closer to the Rio Grande, but now mostly 60s and 70s on the map, at least locally. You get up into North Texas, we've got some 40s and 50s. There's a weak frontal boundary that's off to the north right now, uh, basically between Junction and Abilene, Austin and Dallas, a weak cold front, and this is going to wiggle north and south over the next 12 to 18 hours or so, and then finally plunge southward and grab some of the cooler air from the plains. Oklahoma City now 28, Wichita, Kansas at 24. So front arrival time, roughly around noon, 11 a.m. or noon locally here in San Antonio, and of course, a little bit later, a few hours later, farther south of town. Temps will peak around the noon hour and then fall off. So tomorrow morning, you'll still notice a chill in the air, near 40 degrees and even lower 30s in the hill country by the noon hour. We make it into the 70s along the Rio Grande, 65 in San Antonio, but it's going to be short-lived. 
because into the afternoon when we typically be the warmest, it's actually going to cool off. So keep the jacket handy. Don't put it away during the day as temperatures will only briefly be warm around noon and then fall off again. And the wind's going to pick up. We'll have gusts around 25 miles per hour uh, after the noon hour. Quiet across the state right now. No real rain chances until Saturday. 20% don't expect much. If anything, middle to end of next week, more promising rain chances. Right now we have it a 30% chance, but uh, there is the possibility we could be increasing that. We just got to keep an eye on the trends. So breezy tomorrow, wall to wall sunshine, temperatures briefly spiking at noon and then falling off. And notice by the weekend we're into the 70s, gray and somewhat drizzly and damp on Saturday, but not much to show for it. Then clearing out again Sunday with our next cold front hitting Sunday afternoon. OK, thank you, Adam. All right, maybe an unexpected rookie showing up last night for the Spurs, Larry. Yeah, Joe Wieskamp. I mean, he can shoot. He just hasn't had a lot of opportunities this season with the parent club. Last night he had a chance, and he definitely was a bright spot for the Spurs. And how is Mike McCarthy approaching the Dallas Cowboys regular season finale? Coming up. It was great seeing him hit, get in and hit a couple jumpers. Uh, I look to find him every time we're out there because I, I know what he's capable of, and he's starting to show it a little bit. So I was happy for him. Rookies stick together. Joshua Primo loves seeing Joe Wieskamp score some points last night in big board sports. Spurs center Jakob Pertl led the offensive charge last night with 19 points and 12 rebounds in the Spurs 129 to 104 loss at Toronto. That's his second straight double double and 11th this season. Rookie shooting guard Joshua Primo scored 15 points off the bench in 28 minutes in his return home to Canada. And fellow rookie Joe Wieskamp scored a career high 13 points all in the fourth quarter, making his first three field goal attempts. Now he ended the night with just eight total points this season. Josh and I have been putting a lot of work in behind the scenes um, mm -hmm. and we were just thankful for the opportunity to get out there and play a little bit more extended minutes um, and just have an opportunity to showcase what we can do. Um, just try to go out there and be aggressive, play with energy. Obviously we're down, but um, just try to control what we can control and uh, play as hard as we can, both on the defensive and offensive end. And I think that we did a good job doing that tonight. Celtics will host the Spurs coming up at 6.30. Spurs point guard DeJounte Murray is not listed on the injury report, but Doug McDermott and Lonnie Walker IV are still out for health and safety protocols. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys rookie linebacker Micah Parsons was placed on the reserve COVID-19 list today. He didn't practice today and could miss the regular season finale at Philadelphia. Parsons can return in time to play in Saturday's game if he's fully vaccinated. Players who are fully vaccinated can still test out of the NFL's protocols if they turn into negative COVID-19 tests in a 24-hour period. If Parsons is unvaccinated, he would be required to miss five days before he can return, meaning he can't play Saturday. In the meantime, how is head coach Mike McCarthy approaching this game? We're going to play. We're going to play to win the game. Uh, so that, that's our approach. You know, obviously with everything in front of us, we understand, you know, the scenarios and so forth. Uh, but, yeah, we're, we're going to Philadelphia and, and um, we're going to, you know, line up to do what we need to do to win the game. Eagles will host the Cowboys Saturday night, 715 live right here in case at 12. Dallas has a 22 and 20 record in Saturday games. Last night, Wagner High School celebrated Austin Nunez, who recently topped 1500 career points. Head coach Rodney Clark said Nunez did it in about two and a half years. The senior point guard will play college ball at Arizona State for coach Bobby Hurley. Before the Thunderbirds beat Steele last night, 71-68, Austin told the media his teammates are a huge reason why he's topped 1500 career points. They play a big part in, in the reason why I, myself has had success in the season. Uh, just staying after practice, just getting extra work in, just those little things help us in the long run. So they've been with me this whole ride. It's an honor. I mean, I put in a lot of work in the gym, so just to get recognized is just something cool. Congratulations to Austin. We'll be back right after the break.
San Antonio Bear County once again dealing with another surge in COVID-19. A different variant this time certainly presents different challenges. So let's talk to San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg about what we know right now and where we are. Mayor, thanks for being here. I, I want to talk about testing because we showed long lines, people waiting hours in cars to get their tests, even as testing sites were closing at the end of the day. So what's being done here locally to increase the testing capacity we have? Well, the first thing is to make sure people know where they can get tests. And the city, uh, our community has 17 curative test sites. Uh, those are That's the company that we work with for the PCR tests that are available for free to the public. But please know if you are having symptoms, you can also call your doctor, your clinic, uh, your private provider, and they also have tests available that you can go get tested at. So not just those 17 sites and the new test sites that we're going to be announcing, but oh, there's availability of tests out there. There's capacity. Um, the, the tests that are short uh, nationally and that we're working to acquire uh, many tens of thousands for our community uh, are the rapid tests. Now, um, those have some degree of inaccuracy. Um, they're not as good as the PCR tests in terms of the accuracy of the data, but it does give you an answer quickly. Uh, we're working just like every city in the country to acquire more of those. But testing capacity is uh, available. Uh, we know there's some long lines, so we're opening addition, additional sites, but we want to make sure that people know where they can get a test. And it's not just those mass testing sites. You can also call your doctor or your clinician. And I want, I want to point out when you talk about testing capacity and you just alluded to that you're going to be announcing uh, additional sites in the coming days with some tomorrow in partnership with Community Labs, the local group uh, that set up testing in some of the area schools, correct? That's right. And uh, we have three sites that we're going to be announcing tomorrow. Uh, one of them that will be operational by the morning. Uh, and then uh, we're going to be working on additional sites throughout the week and we'll announce those as well. And we do have an additional site uh, on top of that coming from the state as well as FEMA. I believe, uh, you know, you put out some information saying stay tuned on, on, on that as far as the location. Let's talk about what the numbers right now, because Omicron is different than Delta. It's affecting people in a different way. So how has that sort of changed the game in, in this surge? The difference with Omicron, well, there's several differences with Omicron, and, and one of the key differences here and why the, the nation is really uh, working to get its hands around this is that it's come on so quickly uh, that it is so communicable, so contagious, that it is washing over every city in the country, in particular cities in Texas, like a hurricane. And what people need to be aware is that because it's so contagious, you're going to come in contact with it. The question is, what have you done to prepare yourself when that happens? Have you been vaccinated? Have you gotten your booster? Are you wearing a well-fitting mask? All those things will increase the likelihood that your exposure to it won't become a full-blown illness. Now, the other thing that we're seeing with Omicron, and we hope that the data continues to bear this out, is even though it's very, very contagious, uh, the health impacts on an individual basis, particularly those who have been boosted, uh, and who have their their uh, their uh, vaccination uh, it are, are much milder effects. And so we're not seeing the level of hospitalization on an individual basis. But because it's rapidly happening all across the community, all across the state and the nation all at once, uh, that's why we're seeing the numbers in the hospital. The other key difference here that we've got to be uh, paying attention to is the fact that, you know, we rely on teachers and nurses and doctors and firefighters and first responders, police officers to be on the job. But if they turn up ill, that's going to have an operational impact on us. So we, we're working very diligently. All of the, the service uh, essential services in our community are working very diligently to brace for that impact and to make sure that we're prepared for that. And you're seeing augmented staffing. Um, through other agencies for, for helping with nursing shortages. It's not so much that there's hospitalization that is just um, crushing in terms of volume of patients. It's the fact that we also are having staffing issues because people are out sick. So we have to be aware of that and prepare ourselves for that. Should we, should, uh, should we have done a better job as a city, Metro Health in particular, 
of keeping track of these numbers over the holidays because I know there was a big information gap there uh, between Christmas and, and New Year's really as far as what the actual numbers were in our city. And then when we got back, that's when we noticed that these numbers were jumping exponentially. I mean, should should we have gotten out in front of this sooner? We were, and, and I will tell you this, Steve, the, the numbers jumping as they are were not because of a lag in data. It's happening that rapidly. Uh, the, what was happening on the, and the data on the website was being uploaded, and it was there on a daily basis through spreadsheets that we're getting from the state. Uh, but the, the, the rise in the number of cases that you've seen, the, the incredible jump of 11,000 cases in three days to start the new year here, is actually how fast this thing is, has risen. Remember, um, two weeks ago here in the city, uh, we were at 2% positivity rate. That's jumped to 27% in two weeks. The same is true across the state of Texas, uh, which has jumped to 33% positivity rate in a time, in the, in the span of three days to begin this new year. In the state of Texas, there was nearly 150,000 new cases. So Omicron is actually sweeping through communities that fast. And so we've got to make sure that when it does reach you, that you're prepared for that and you prepare yourself by getting vaccinated and by wearing a, a well-fitting mask. If you do that, uh, your, your exposure to Omicron will not result in a severe illness. Are you, you know, there are some people that are saying in South Africa and other countries that have dealt with Omicron, it has been basically a two week surge and then it's kind of died off. Are you feeling, are you getting any kind of expert advice that that will be the same case here? We certainly hope so. And, and we don't want to jump to any conclusions with the data, but we are watching in communities where, you know, they're they were slightly ahead of us or in the case of the UK or in South Africa, where this was first detected. Uh, those communities that have gone through the initial wave, their peak happened early and it started to decline very, very fast. The health uh, community that that I've spoken to believes that the same will be true. But remember, as you're going through a hurricane, which is kind of what this feels like, you've got to brace yourself. You've got to be prepared. Uh, it's going to be a rough ride. But there is another side of this. When it passes through, we're going to be able to recover quite nicely. But but again, our issues right now are, are the exposure, the communicability of this disease is, is so prevalent because so contagious that you have to assume that you're going to come in contact with the virus. And when you do, you want to be prepared. You want to be protected. And that comes in the form of vaccination, booster, and then, of course, wearing a mask. Yeah, that sharp decline after the peak is something that the epidemiologist we talked right. to on this very segment yesterday was hopeful about. But as you're saying, Mayor, in the meantime, at this point, everyone knows what we need to be doing. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, continue. No, I, I just wanted to say our, our focus right now is to, to keep operations going. We cannot afford to have schools close and see all of the, the residual impacts on our economy and on people's lives that happen when there's massive closures of these operations, when we don't have to do that, when people are prepared with, with the tools that we have available to us. So it will be a rough ride, but hopefully we will get through this uh, quickly and, and without too much health impact. And we're hoping everybody does the right thing here. Absolutely. Mayor Ron Nuremberg, happy new year to you. Haven't seen you since the new year. So thank you for your time and uh, keep us updated, please, with what the numbers and, and what the operations looks like, certainly when it comes to city operations. And like you said, police, fire, emergency rooms, all those things we're going to need to be watching right. over the next few days. And we'll have details on those new testing sites. It sounds like uh, soon as well. Mayor, thanks. Will do. Happy new year. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Just a couple of uh, reminders about uh, construction. Still have this here on Loop 1604. Not just the North Project between 281 and I-10, but also uh, west of I-10 there from all the way over to Bandera Road. So watch out for that construction this evening. Uh, this is also going on this week. Some ramp closures at 1604 at 281. Those begin at 9 o'clock. They're doing some work there as well. Speaking of 281, still at least in our system showing some uh, major delays there north of uh, Stone Oak TPC Parkway. So uh, keep that in mind uh, this evening if you need to uh, head up 
that direction this evening. Also, this is a look at 410 at uh, Ingram Road. Things look fine here, but we do uh, have a new crash reported I-10 and 410 Callahan Road area. That's causing some slowdowns as well. Steve, Myra. Thanks, Sam. Nice day out there today. We've enjoyed the warm up but won't have to wait too long to cool back down again. Matt. Yeah, more of a typical temperature trend for this time of year. Big spreads throughout one day and then throughout the week when you're comparing highs, big jumps up and down as well. So one of those situations where you just need to stay on top of it. Nothing to worry about this evening and tonight. We're 70 degrees right now. We'll be cooling pretty quickly and efficiently by 10 o'clock mid 50s. Midnight will be dipping down into the upper 40s and most of us staying above freezing tomorrow morning. I'll break down the low temperature map and talk about tomorrow's cold front that hits around noon and what it means for the winds and temperatures tomorrow coming up. All right, where are we on this ride? This temperature ride that we're taking this week? feels like we're up. <laughs> Am I right? It feels you know, like we're at the crest. Yeah, you know when you're on a roller coaster, you're tick, 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 yeah. tick, tick. That's the part I hate. And then you stop here in that tick and get ready for it and you yeah. drop off. This isn't going to be as extreme of a temperature drop as what we had over the weekend, but very noticeable. I mean, our high temperatures with this next cold front will be going from 70 degrees today down into the 50s by Friday. And we're talking lower 50s, so well into the 70s down into the lower 50s, a very noticeable front. Here's another way to look at it in terms of just comparing high temperatures day to day. Tomorrow at the noon hour, we'll hit 65. It's going to be a brief warm up tomorrow. And then Friday, we're only 53. But if you don't like that, the weekend is all yours. We'll be back to 70 degrees until the next cold front hits Sunday afternoon. Woo! A lot of cold fronts to keep track of here, so let's get right to it. Today we topped out at 77 after a morning low of 38. Big temperature spread throughout the day. Clear sky, dry air. We get those cool mornings and then comfortably warm afternoons. Average high, by the way, 63 degrees, as I showed you before, will be below the average high come Friday. Carrizo Springs down to 57 now. Kerrville 55. Gonzalez, just one degree shy of 70. Austin's 57. Meanwhile, 70 in San Antonio. So wide ranging temperatures out there right now, and they cool off even more as you head farther north into Texas, up to North Texas. Abilene 53, Dallas 54. There's a weak cold front just to the north of us, north of Austin, north of Junction. And this is going to wiggle around a little bit overnight and first thing tomorrow, and then eventually plunge southward by midday tomorrow when we'll pick up on some of that colder air. Now, speaking of the colder air, take a look at it there. I mean, we've got temperatures down in the single digits and even below zero closer to the Canadian border. That's the core of the cold air and the core of the cold air is going to stay away from us. But nonetheless, this is what you can expect tomorrow morning. A chill in the air, the jacket weather to start 41 Pleasanton, 39 Hondo and Uvalde, a brief light freeze in a good portion of the hill country. And then by the noon hour, that's when we're at our peak temperature for the day. 70s near 80 along the Rio Grande, but locally around San Antonio, about 65 degrees. I mean, we'll be anywhere from 71 in Von Army to 64 Bernie, 66 for the noon temperature in New Braunfels. But you look at the temperature trend just throughout the day. Usually it's the warmest right here around 4 p.m. This time of year, this is going to be a little different. You'll want the jacket in the morning by noon. You'll say, ah, I don't need it the rest of the day. Oh, ho, ho, ho. But then the cold front hits and I do think you'll need it later on. So don't just put it away and and put it in the closet, throw it over the chair or hook it next to the door where where you, know, you can just easily grab it. Winds will be gusty as well and you won't notice it in the morning, but by noon and afternoon, we'll have those wind gusts up to 25 miles per hour. And by the way, it's that north wind. So the cedar breeze this time of year. I would not be surprised if that mountain cedar count jumps, if not tomorrow afternoon by the Friday morning reading. Big picture has a jet stream just to the north of us and some activity along it here through the midsection of the country and more moisture coming on shore in the Pacific Northwest. We often get our upper level systems from the Pacific Northwest. There is a little bit of hope for a few sprinkles on Saturday. Fog, drizzle, a little bit of dampness, nothing to really show for it and a few hit or miss light showers. Middle of next week, Wednesday, 
That's where we're crossing our fingers where there could be better potential for rainfall. Right now we have a 30%, but there is a potential we could be raising that in the days ahead. So becoming breezy tomorrow, the warmest point of the day, noon, then temperatures fall off. And Saturday's just a fairly gray day, that 20%, so a few hit or miss light showers, noticeable humidity just for Saturday. Cold front hits on Sunday, picking up the wind again and dropping temperatures for the early part of next week back into the upper 50s. Tomorrow, one of those strange days where it's warmer in the morning than it is at night. It happens. Yep. Yep. Yeah. In case you missed it, coming up next. Wow. Well. Yes, we're going to do uh, traffic here. This is uh, Loop 410 at Ingram. You can see uh, things looking uh, fine in, in that area, uh, but we do have a crash not too far away from there, Adam, at uh, I-10 and Loop 410. So uh, watch out for, for that this evening. Worry about weather wise, we're talking temperatures quickly falling off, but we'll be down near 40 tomorrow morning. A brief light freeze in the hill country, then breezy tomorrow, 65 at noon. Temperatures falling off thereafter. And I do think Friday will be the next freeze locally uh, with temperatures closer to 30 degrees. And Friday afternoon, a cool day, especially with the increasing clouds, 53 the high temperature. And then this weekend, Saturday is going to be the gray day, humid. Some morning fog and drizzle. We're used to that trend from December and a straight sprinkler light showers. 20% chance, but 70 degrees. Then Sunday back to sunshine. Sure, we'll hit 73, but that's at noon and then temperatures fall off quickly thereafter as we get into the early part of next week. More promising potential for a pattern that could favor some rain by the middle of next week. Right now we only have 30% chance. There's not a lot of confidence in much coverage, but uh, that may be changing depending on what we see in the days ahead.